Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness is the latest in the MCU assembly line we will be riding till the end of days. One thing that has caught people's attention from the trailer is a line from one Wanda Maximoff, aka the Scarlet Witch. You break the rules. Look out! I become a hero. I do it. I become the enemy. That doesn't seem fair. This <laughs> caused a discourse. So that brings up a big question. Was Wanda sufficiently punished in the events of WandaVision to help her justify this line read in Multiverse of Madness? Without the context of actually having seen the film in terms of how this plays out within the narrative. Because hopefully I get this out before the movie comes out. And like, no, not really. But it's complicated. Do you believe in magic? So I want to just go through Wanda's backstory for context. If you're watching this, you likely know all this kind of stuff, but again, it helps me build my point. So here we go. She was born in the fictional Eastern York town of Sokovia with her brother Pietro and her parents, presumably one of these is Magneto, but who knows. She learned English by watching old American sitcoms, which apparently is a very common way of people learning English. It's like friends and stuff like that. This became a source of comfort for her, which becomes way more prevalent as we go into WandaVision. Her and Pietro survive because of her powers kicking in at that moment. This is a retcon, but we'll see where they go with this. On the side of the missile, she sees the Stark Industries label, which is highly convenient for, you know, comic books. This helps her develop an animosity towards the Starks, in particular Tony, as we find out later on. This also brings up a rather recurring theme in her life, and a depressing one at that. Whenever she goes through a great trauma, an aspect of her powers becomes more prevalent and becomes more active. So it directly links her trauma to her powers and how they kind of veer off. The twins become anti-American rebels where they're recruited by Hydra for forms of experiments. Now people use this whole she joined Nazis thing to try to discredit her character and her actions later on but to be fair it's made really obvious that she doesn't seem to know or really care what Hydra are doing. She's using them as a means to an end. Their latent powers are unlocked using the Mind Stone, again this is a retcon but whatever, and they become Quicksilver and the Scarlet Witch. This leads us into Age of Ultron. In a rather rushed fashion, after joining Ultron and realizing he's planning to destroy the world, they join the Avenger side, and in a battle where Sokovia is utterly decimated, Quicksilver is killed by Ultron. We see another kind of form of her powers come out, and that's her kind of sense of empathy, her ability to connect people empathically. We see this as Pietro dies, that she feels his death as it happens. This is how she knows about it. We see more of this kind of empathy connection power, because her powers before are just kind of hacking into people and hexing them to make them see the greatest fears. But here, she's able to actually feel the pain rather than just inflict it, and this will come up later in WandaVision. Without Pietro, she clings onto Ultron and begins a courtship with him because he's just really swell. She accidentally causes the death of nine people in Lagos, and this is where we go into Civil War and the Sokovian Court. In this story, Wanda is kept prisoner by Tony and Vision for her own safety and because people would be afraid of how powerful she is, but she eventually escapes this. She gets captured, is freed by Steve, and eventually runs to Scotland where her and Vision start a full relationship relationship there for two years. This leads us into Infinity War. Now one of the main conflicts in this film is the fact that Vision's Mind Stone, if it's removed, because it's so attached to Nora Lynx in his synthetic body, it will eventually just kill him because it's literally his mind. And Wanda actually has the power to do so because her powers were amplified with the Mind Stone, which means she can destroy the stones before Thanos gets to them. So we have a conflict here where Wanda obviously doesn't want to kill the only person she really has left. So this drags out until the very bitter end, where in a rather tearful moment, she uses her powers to destroy it and kills the last person in her life. Only for that to be reversed through a time method, so Thanos can just yank it out of Vision's head and kill him again. Girl has no luck. After the five year time skip and we see a rather terrifying amplification of her powers, she goes to the sword facility to pick up Vision's body, only to realize there is nothing there. I can't feel you. Dejected and heartbroken, she ends up going to New Jersey where she finds a small plot of land bought in Westview by Vision for the two of them. I'm assuming there he was going to work out the whole fugitive of the law thing before they broke ground. I don't know. This eventually causes her to utterly, utterly snap 
and her next stage of her powers gets released, what's known as chaos magic. This eventually spreads and connects to every single person in Westview and controls them in this kind of marionette style as they live out Wanda's fantasy of being in a sitcom, whether they want to or not. And this is a stage of those with trauma, they find a comfort piece that they're allowed to develop themselves into and decompartmentalize from everything they've gone through. And sitcoms make sense because they have a happy resolution within 22 minutes, so they're predictable and they're safe. So it makes sense why she connects to them so much. This isn't really something that she brought over to everyone who she controls, but this is why she did it. <laughs> I'd love to delve into that more thoroughly, but this isn't a video about WandaVision specifically. The point is, Wanda sees sitcoms as a comfort, and in her broken mind and her powers expanding beyond control, has everyone fall within the vicinity into this reality. Because she thinks that everyone would find comfort in sitcoms and wants to stay in this area. That's where her mind is at now. Her presumption is that everyone around her will feel the same as she does. Which obviously she is wrong. And yeah, this is a huge point brought up in Wanda's whole this is a man's world kind of vibe where yeah, she, she can have an entire town to make them act out a little fantasy. When people po start pointing out like Vision, like Monica, like Sword, she reacts to them rather hostilely. And that is a point against the show that I don't think they really examine how culpable Wanda is. There's a great video by Shauna Leek out, which I will link in the description. You should definitely check that out because it goes into this in more detail. However, the framing the narrative gives is one of trauma. Wanda has everything taken from her and this is her reaction to that. She has gone to the stage where she is in complete denial over everything that's going on and just wants to live in this idyllic life away from her miserable, depressing reality and will hold on to that no matter what. And this is an extension of her empathy powers because beyond her knowing, she actually projects her trauma and her nightmares into the town, which when they're in stasis, this is what they're being felt. They're feeling her pain and her anguish. And again, this is not known to her, we find out later on in the finale. It's on track with those who completely lose touch and clarity when they're on the verge of a complete mental breakdown. Uh, but they don't have chaos magic to ruin everyone else lies around them. So her defensiveness when Vision, Monica and Sword try to break her out of this is completely predicated on the fact that she sees all this as an attack, but she can no longer accept her reality. She just wants to live within this illusion. And again, in her reality, everything is gone. Here, she's married to the love of her life and with kids. Outside there, she doesn't have either. It doesn't justify her actions, but it absolutely rationalizes them as somebody who's been through so much pain and trauma and regret, having the magical influence of everyone around her. It adds layers to that characterization, and I think that's what makes one division work. And like I said, none of this justifies what she does, but it does make sense why she kept holding on to this until she's forced to face the reality of what she's pushing the town people of Westview through. And in like less than an hour, she reverses the spell and loses vision and her children. I don't know, your mileage may vary here, but I think it makes this a lot more nuanced and interesting than Twitter is trying to frame her actions as. Though, again, I need to stress, the way they dismiss the town's reaction after she reverses the spell is bullshit. They'll never know what you sacrificed for them. Yeah, fuck off. Also, she put someone in the same mental trap that she put the entire town through and then left them there within the town. What the fuck? She's not a monster. She's a woman who went to a mount of PTSD who finally snapped and let her powers dictate her actions and wrap her in this cocoon of blissful ignorance to everything going around her. Because if she lets her guard down, she lets in the pain and sometimes it's unbearable for anyone to take. Imagine what it would be like if you had these kind of powers. So yeah, wanted a lot of shitty things, but I think the framework of her mental health, while not excusing anything, at least makes sense in terms of her defensiveness and bitterness, which adds context to this line, if this is the direction the movie is going in. But let's look at the person she is talking against. What are Stephen Strange's crimes? Doctor, doctor. 
Stephen Strange's arc is all about hubris. He starts off as an arrogant surgeon with no real care about the skills he has, just wanting to show people how great he is and keep himself away from failure. This doesn't even go away after he pursues magic as a way to heal his arms. He pushes it in this kind of obstinate, arrogant way, including against our queen, Tilda Swinton. Man, it's really awkward her character was whitewashed. The reason I've come to bargain works so well is that Strange is finally able to use his abilities in ways that are clever and work above his need for self-preservation and his ego. He risks trapping himself in a time loop for eternity if it means helping others because he finally realizes it's not about you. We see this further in the following Avengers movies where he puts a lot of weighty emphasis on protecting the time stone but then gives it up instantly when he realizes he needs to do this for the greater good. He sacrifices five years of his life to get the stones destroyed and protect the universe. And then in his next appearance He's a jackass. So Strange has that Black Widow problem where he's just a different character with every person who gets to write for him. And man, is this clear in No Way Home because he is an asshole to Peter even when he's trying to help him. He rushes his kid into a spell without noting the devastating consequences of it or the ramifications of what doing the spell and having succeed would be just because he feels slighted about Wong getting the position of Sorcerer Supreme while he was off Earth, which frankly Wong should have had it in the first place. Never stops for a second before casting the spell to explain to Peter, hey, look, everyone will forget your Spider-Man, including myself, including your friends and family. Would you have reservations if those are the stakes? He also shows that he can, like, add people to those who remember it beforehand anyway. Couldn't he do that before casting the spell and get this out of the way before messing it up and causing the plot? Nope, he just enters the spell and then infers that everyone will forget about him, causing Peter to freak out. And then he gets mad at Peter because this high school student doesn't realize you can just write to administrative boards for colleges to argue your case about joining. And then Strange just gets fridged for the rest of the movie kind of taken out as soon as they gather up all the, the enemies and by the time he comes back it's really difficult for him to face any consequences for the shitty way he's behaving because the story is about Peter and Peter learning a lesson so that's the focus of it not him. Strange is barely a character in No Way Home he's more of a kind of glorified MacGuffin that gives us a cool action scene and that that's about it and he gets the ball rolling and that's really all he contributes to this. So yeah, his rashness and arrogance, previously thought to have been quelled, nearly causes the destruction of the universe. It's clear through the trailers that this will come up as a consequence for Strange in this new movie, which good. But Wanda was previously motivated, I agree, selfishly, through powers she previously did not know she had that completely just t took over control of her mental state to traumatize people unbeknownst to her. Strange was motivated by pettiness and managed to nearly destroy the entire point of reality, which would not only traumatize us, but you know, kill us all. So yeah, as tunnel vision as Wanda's comment can be, she does have a point that more people probably should be miffed at this guy. So yeah, WandaVision and No Way Home have these characters not be acknowledged for the shitty way they behave and the consequences of that and facing the consequences of their actions. But let's look at a hero that's all about consequences. In fact, his consequence became the first MCU superhero and someone with a very close connection to Wanda's story. <laughs> Tony Stark's arc is all about hubris and also war crimes. Having quite the opposite upbringing from Wanda, Tony grew up in the lap of privilege and luxury and eventually inherited his father's weapon manufacturing company. And while he's a lot more likeable than Strange, Tony is also really corrupt and completely uncaring about his company's involvement with the weapons trade, even being called out by reporters he ends up sleeping with. And also, Pepper implies she's a slut, which, like, Girl. Anyway, Stark is very much brought down to Earth by being attacked by one of his company's weapons and having a bit of shrapnel go towards his heart, crippling him. And he realizes his first fear is that the weapons he's been selling have been used by terrorists. Woo! Yeah, Iron Man hasn't aged that well. And also you find out that these weapons were sold by his business partner behind his back, which makes sense of why he wouldn't know that they had these weapons. But also it kind of overlooks the fact that his company must be complicit in a lot more of the issues with the military industrial complex. Okay, 
Good. Anyway, Stark learns the lesson of his ways by building a suit of armor and showing he's no longer involved in this corrupt war business by being on foreign soil as a free agent and attacking a terrorist cell. He stops his company making weapons, kills his business partner, and reveals the world that I am Iron Man. Solidifying his commitment to do the right thing and go into the right path away from his corrupted past, which good for him. We see him trying to live up to this commitment within the next few films until the Avengers where he finds out that aliens exist and they are coming for Earth. The immediate follow to this is an Iron Man 3 where we see he has panic attacks. While I like this film, I'm not crazy about them removing the shrapnel from his heart, which has been done in other versions of the comics, but I think it removes his uniqueness as being a hero who is technically disabled. This pop one actually does come up a lot compared to Strange's hands, but doesn't really come up that often, so that was a shame. Also his PTSD is like resolved within the third act and outside of some Thing, minor references to it in future films doesn't really become a thing but the psychological effects of what he witnesses does become a plot point later on and that's when we get the age of ultron again and all of this is pushed by wanda she casts a hex spell on him which makes him see his fallen comrades and the alien from the first avengers realizing his worst fear in reality is losing everyone and him powerless to do anything to stop it so with this he gets banner and nobody else and decides to build an ai through the mind stone to try to create as he calls it a suit of armor around the world this goes badly so badly in fact it creates a genocidal robot who wants to destroy the planet and then destroys Sokovia. Not a great move. This is such a massive linch point within the MCU that the Accords that try to control the heroes are called the Sokovian Accords. And this is all because Tony let his rashness and fear take control of him. So do you think with all this in mind that Tony would have learned his lesson? Nope, in the very same movie, Age of Ultron, he decides to combat Ultron by creating another AI in a stronger body in order to try to defeat him. Once again, not telling anyone outside of Banner. So the logic of having Jarvis be the basis of Vision's AI does make sense because he's been stopping Ultron from getting certain new codes that could have him destroy the world within seconds. But again, he's hiding it from people and it's it's just, he, this could go wrong in so many ways and he does not consider any of them after releasing the genocidal robot. Another robot, again, in a body that's really difficult to defeat. It's made by one of the strongest metals on Earth. You'd think this would be the basis for him to be so adamant about the Accords in Civil War after all they're named after Scovia. But the text makes it seem like he's just bad that they didn't tell Hulk to look both ways before he smashed. Not for the fact that he created a villain that nearly destroyed the world. In the comics, this causes Hank Pym to have a mental breakdown. This is when he infamously hits his wife. We're not going into that. And sure, you could say that it's implicit that his guilt over Ultron is what's motivating him, but in a movie all about being held accountable, it needs to be implicit. Tony seems more bothered about keeping the Avengers together than he is about facing the consequences of his genocidal robot actions. So does he learn anything from this? It doesn't appear so because he throws this in Steve's face at the beginning of Endgame. What we needed was a suit of armor around the world. Remember that? Whether it impacted our precious freedoms or not, that's what we needed. And yes, in this particular moment, he's traumatized, enraged, and also dying. So you, you can't really blame him for being so rash. But again, we never come back to this. Tony is never really held to the fact that a lot of the consequences for the stuff he does is tunnel visioned and extremely disastrous and he never seems to learn from this. His arc in Endgame is learning to let go of this, but it's more framed that he's too gosh darn invested in making sure people are okay and he can't just let go of that fear rather than, you know, his actions having major consequences for when he tries to prevent all this. While Tony's savior complex and anxieties are woven into the narrative, you're not really given the full scope of the consequences his actions have and him facing that. His motives are purer than Wanda's, but he has a much larger body count and he keeps on doing this stuff over and over again without seeming to learn. So yeah, two heroes who don't face consequences in their movies or seemingly at all, if you want to argue that. Now let's look at somebody else. Not really so much a hero in this regard. Loki, trickster god. The segment shouldn't be that long. But yeah, he started off as a villain, 
as in trying to cause a genocide to appease daddy and then trying to take over the world so they'll all worship him. Villain. So he's brought back to Asgard in the Dark World and he's forced to witness the death of his mother, one of the only people who seems to truly care about him and consider his needs. This marks a turning point in his character where he does something that's not at the behest of himself. He helps Thor get off Asgard and then sacrifice himself. Or at least pretends to sacrifice himself. He's still a villain at this point, even if it's more of an anti-villain kind of way where he dethrones his father and throws him onto Midgard under an enchantment. I do believe he did all these things for Frigga, but he's still very much selfishly motivated at this point. While I'm not doing an entire deep dive on the MCU Loki, as fun as he is, his entire character is motivated by belonging. He feels rejected and looked down on by his father and his brother. And when he finds out he's adopted, he gets this seeding sense of resentment and rage that kind of motivates him throughout most of these following. So in Ragnarok, when Thor tells him that he means the world to him, it actually gets true to Loki. And while partially him saving Thor in the end of Ragnarok is motivated by his own ego, I think he begins to slowly realize how important his brother is to him. Especially the case as they are the only family the two of them have left at this point. This doesn't entirely redeem him, neither is the sacrifice at the beginning of Infinity War. But it shows that he went from somebody so filled with resentment towards his family, he cast his brother out into the outskirts and then tried to get him killed to somebody who uses his trickster powers to try to save his brother. It's a nice little complete arc, even if I'm not a huge fan of that moment. And then... Endgame gave us an alternate universe Loki who escapes, gets brought to this alternate universe place where he sees a highlight reel of all his development from the other films. At this point, we're meant to think he has somewhat on the same path by the end of Ragnarok. Yeah. And again, this is before any of his character growth has even started. So, need to point out, this is the villain who becomes a kind of romantic swashbuckling hero. Again, and Loki isn't focused on... His redemption is focused on his idea of, for lack of a better term, self-love, but he doesn't really face any sort of consequences outside the fact that he keeps failing upwards in this regard and has nothing to do with his actions as a villain. You can absolutely say that Wanda gets way too much of a pass for her actions in WandaVision, but you can't say that the same doesn't also apply to Loki in his show, as much as I enjoy it. Pretty good show. So all these male characters do these actions and don't seem to face consequences for them and people don't really hold them to account for that. Whereas Wanda does it and everyone's kind of scrutinizing her for it. What does this tell us? You took everything from me. A lot of this video was inspired partially by this TikTok I found during the whole w w Wanda gate, if you want to call it that. Being an overly emotional feminine stereotype is fundamentally woven into her character. And it is for that reason, and that reason alone, that she is consistently vilified in the MCU, in fandom, in the comic books. Just in the MCU alone, every single character could be written off as just as villainous and evil and wrong as Wanda so frequently is. So what's the difference between all of those examples and Wanda? All of those heroes consciously made the choice to do what they were doing. And most of the time, even when people get hurt with Doctor Strange, with Tony Stark, because they had good intentions, that's why people forgive them. The difference with Wanda is that her power can frequently be subconscious. She frequently does things unintentionally or has a power that she can't control, which makes her abilities intrinsically passive, which again, is feminine coded. And that is why she's treated differently. Because an emotional woman will always be seen as more of a threat than an overconfident man. And that's Wanda's point. Not that she's some perfect person, but that she's held to a completely different set of standards than everyone else. I think it's an interesting perspective and I linked it below because I don't really want to play this woman's entire video to you rather than just, you know, just watch it yourself, you know. She supported creators. So is this just like subconscious sexism? Maybe? The thing is, I think that lets WandaVision a bit off the hook because it's not like that show doesn't have faults in its depictions as I've gone through. Again, it's not like they try to ignore all this moral ambiguity. The fact that these people are terrified of Wanda and incredibly traumatized by what they went through because of her self-help Lucille Ball inspired seminar. And the show tries to act that these people should be more forgiving of her because she zapped a fake family back into non-existence. I mean, it, it doesn't seem incredibly self-aware of what these people must be feeling in this moment. But looking at this and the other MCU characters, I think it portrays a bigger problem that seems to be recurring, and that is trying to make them as sympathetic as possible 
while also having their actions be damaging and highlight that for the sake of drama. It robs the audience of coming to that conclusion themselves and instead tries to force them to think, oh no, Wanda is very good. These other people are worse than her, even though she is the main culprit of all the terrible actions within the show. A really frustrating example of this is Hayward because fundamentally he is right, but his actions are depicted as so ridiculously cartoonishly evil. We can't consider that at all. I said Monica is given more of a moral framework who's a lot more sympathetic towards Wanda, but also never holds her to account in the same way. Again, Hayward is right. Wanda is dangerous and we should consider this considering her mental breakdown captured an entire town for possibly weeks. But we have to make sure that she isn't depicted as incredibly irredeemably evil, which I don't think the show does anyway, but I'm assuming that's what's in their mind, that they don't want people to totally turn against her. So Hayward is bad. Hayward bad. We also have Agatha, with a song saying it was Agatha all along. And as much of a bop as that is, it, it wasn't Agatha. It, it was Wanda. Agatha comes in and she kind of messes stuff around, like with the fake Pietro, but the entire basis of this entire story is not her. But the show treats her a lot more maliciously and as evil because she's motivated by power and not processing out her grief onto other people. To quote Sean Alike here, Agatha is terrible because she's selfish and desires power. Wanda is terrible because she's selfish and has depression. But I mean, if you want to go through this, at least this is acknowledged. Again, Civil War doesn't seem to want to bring up Tony's direct impact on the Sokovian Accords and use that to be the fuel for his guilt and said other stuff like the Avengers being too much collateral damage. Um, it, it makes the film feel a little awkward. And while Loki's actions are acknowledged, they're not really taken in consideration because again, that's not really the point of the story. Maybe this is something that will come up in the later seasons, but we'll have to see. You know, later on doesn't justify any of this because that's, that's an excuse that you hear a lot from people trying to defend the MCU's decisions. If this is stuff not dealt with in the narrative at the time, it's either explicitly, very directly, and obviously meant to be kept for later, and the narrative should make you know that, which it doesn't because the narrative excuses Wanda's culpability and just kind of brushes off Loki's culpability and certain strain, whatever it is. So, like, that's that that doesn't really apply with me. Sorry. And it's not like the MCU is incapable of showing their characters as flawed and broken and also acknowledging this and not trying to hold them to a different standard and honestly risk making them unlikable to the audience. And I have a few issues with Doctor Strange, the movie, but the one thing I will say is that Strange himself is not only shown as flawed and in the wrong, he's kind of unlikable in a lot of the aspects of him obsessively trying to get his old life back on track. It's good. It shows a willingness to risk a character being seen as bad by your audience and their main character even and turning them away from the character if they so choose to think their actions and behavior passes that threshold. And like this isn't really isolated to the MCU. I see it in a lot of narrative where we have characters acting wrong for the sake of drama or just to push the plot along, but we downplay it and mitigate it within the framing of the narrative to make them seem as sympathetic as possible or, you know, keep them likable to the audience. I call this the Daenerys effect where Game of Thrones did this a lot for Danny, especially in the later years where she'd do something terrible and questionable, but the framing of it makes it seem like she shouldn't be held accountable or questioned for the way she behaves in her quest for power. And when she eventually does something utterly irredeemably awful, the show tries to blame us for championing her in a kind of sly way rather than like accepting the fact that they depicted her as being as likable as possible. This wasn't intentional. It was them not having their characters seem unlikable and keep people invested in them being the good guys. And this is really notable in Game of Thrones, especially because like, again, this isn't a show for you know, superheroes fighting good guys. So the good guys have to be seen as a bit more morally standing. These, all these characters are meant to be morally ambiguous. That was one of the selling points of the show. We have other shows like Breaking Bad and Sopranos where they have their main characters do awful, awful things, uh, but we can't really show it for the cool dragon lady in case that makes her unlikable. And it's not just Daenerys that has this problem. We see it with a lot of characters in Game of Thrones where their actions are questionable, but we're not meant to question them. They're likable. Don't think about it. Move rah, rah, rah. And it would be interesting to look into where this attitude comes from, from modern day script writers. It's possible the internet and its hyper screwed ability of like taking these characters' actions and just talking about them to death online. And you have stuff like Quill punching Thanos in Infinity War. 
a moment that completely makes sense in character, even though it's meant to be frustrating. You had it so mean to dead and people legitimately get so angry at Quill that they seem to have another reason to hate him outside of just the actor. And I mean, I don't think any of this goes past like having funny jokes on the internet. But when you're an executive and you're seeing all this venom toward the main character, the lead character in one of your franchises, maybe you're less willing to have your character seem in any kind of way morally compromised and unlikable, but also having them do terrible things so we can get that kind of big water cooler moment, especially in WandaVision, which is a TV show. They have to do that balancing act of this character does something awful, but it's okay because blah, 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 or we're just going to ignore how this is terrible and just move on. And I mean, if this is the case, I, I don't know, I don't have any insight into this. I don't have any insight into writers of this. It didn't work. I mean, I wouldn't be making this video if it worked. <laughs> and one of the mitigating factors with WandaVision may have been the fact that it's a story that specifically deals with mental health and depicting a character with mental illness, specifically being an awful person, may come across negatively in this kind of stereotyping. But I think like this coddles people with mental illness who can be very messy and can do terrible things. And we shouldn't look over this and are motivated by their mental illness. We've seen this with our shows like Crazy Ex-Girlfriend or Bojack Horseman, where we have the main characters deal with mental health problems and do awful, awful things. But the narrative holds them accountable for the terrible shit they do. Hell, in Bojack's case, they were actually worried in case their depiction was making people who acted like this giving them a bit too easy a time and finding somebody too relatable. So they made a part of the narrative just to make sure they weren't doing this depiction. It's that kind of self-awareness and dealing with mental illness that I really admire. I don't think it mitigates the struggles that people with mental illness go through, but it also keeps these characters accountable for their actions. So it's, it's just better storytelling. It's, it's, it's a more realistic depiction of someone with mental illness and how their actions are reflected on in the rest of the world. So I guess my takeaway of, was Wanda justified in chewing Strange out like that, is I hope this means we don't treat her with kids gloves and make her accountable for her actions within the narrative itself. And I mean, she can see herself as justified and still be depicted as wrong. And that seems a lot more interesting to me than just having her not be held accountable and be seen constantly as a victim. She's somebody who's seen that the world has just kind of completely shat on top of her and rightfully so, and has taken that and pushed in a direction where she tries to take more direct action for what her circumstances are, and that can lead to disastrous consequences. That's good storytelling, that's interesting. I still think this works in making her three-dimensional and sympathetic without trying to say that the shit she does can be something that's brushed under the rug. Because WandaVision made her interesting, even if I think they dropped the ball in the final act. And I don't think her doubling down on her desire to get hers is necessarily a bad thing, narratively speaking, because loose cannon three-dimensional characters are fun. As long as you don't say she's right in her actions or try to frame it in that way, then I think we're good here. Because hey, who doesn't love a fucking mess like Wanda?